I've been making uh, notes all morning to remind myself to say certain things during this uh, Trinity Sunday sermon. Some people call this the preacher's nightmare. <laughs> How do you describe the undescribable? <laughs> um, so I've been making some notations to remind myself uh, to tell you certain things. Uh, you know, the older you get, the more you have to write things down. Have any of you noticed that? Uh, it makes me think about the couple, the elderly couple, who um, were having trouble with their memories. And so they went to see the doctor. And uh, he told them, he said, look, you're going to have to start writing things down, things that you don't want to forget. So they went home that evening. They were watching television and uh, she spoke up and said, uh, you know, I sure would like to have a bowl of ice cream. And her husband said, well, I'll be happy to get that for you. And she said, now, remember what the doctor said. You need to write that down so you won't forget. So he got up and went to the kitchen and uh, was in there for a little while. He came back and he handed her a plate of bacon and eggs. <laughs> and she said, well, I should have known. You forgot the toast. <laughs> That's about the way it is, huh? <laughs> It's amazing how the older you get, you know, you can remember things that happened 50 years ago in detail, but you have a hard time remembering what you had for breakfast this morning. <laughs> All right, let's take our Bibles and turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. We're going to be reading verses 16 through 20. This is the lectionary gospel reading. Before I read that, I do want to say that um, I hope that uh, those of you who knew uh, Reverend Bob Merritt will uh, get to see his family today at the wake. It's going to be at the United Parish Church uh, from 1 till 5, 1 till 5 today at United Parish. And the funeral service will be tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock at United Parish. And I would suggest that if you want to attend that service that you get there early. Because I think it's going, we're going to have a, a packed house, a, an overflow crowd, I'm sure. But um, I was so encouraged by what uh, Elaine texted me this week. In her reading, she ran across a verse from... Uh, the 116th Psalm, verse 15, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his faithful servants. And that's certainly appropriate where uh, uh, Bob Merritt is concerned. So let's reach out to that family and express our condolences and uh, be of, of comfort to, to Peg and, and her kids. All right, uh, Matthew chapter 28, beginning with verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When he saw him, or when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age." Let us pray. God above us, God before us, God within us, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
be a bridge now between us across which your truth can move. We pray this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, it's Trinity Sunday, so hold on to your hats. We're about to take a deep dive into one of the most complex, one of the most wonderfully complex, but life-giving of Christian beliefs. So if you came to church today hoping to learn more about yourself, hoping to find something that would uh, make your life a little easier, um, this morning we're talking about God. Not you, not me. We're talking about the God called Trinity. Why do we have uh, such a strange concept as God as Trinity, God as triune? Well, we have this doctrine, this teaching, because of Jesus Christ. You see, many people thought that they had a good grasp on who God was and what God was up to, and then came Jesus. <laughs> Listening to him, watching him do his work, uh, watching him die on the cross and rise from the dead, people immediately had to start revising and complexifying their notions of God. You see, everything that we believe about God flows from what we have seen in Jesus Christ. In Jesus Christ... God gets personal. In Jesus Christ, God gets relational. God gets available and virtually unavoidable. <laughs> Too close for comfort for some. God gets multifaceted, complex and challenging. Too much so for our simple explanations of God. You know, sometimes I talk to people all the time about God. And uh, sometimes I will say, well, well, talk to me about the God that you believe in. And by the time they get through, um, I, uh, I, you know, I, I often discover that the God that they are talking about uh, doesn't seem to be the God who revealed himself in Jesus Christ. In his first advent, in his first arrival, in his first coming among us, Jesus as Son of God, as the Messiah, the Anointed One of God, challenged people's notions about God. Lots of people, uh, you know, looked at Jesus, they listened to his teachings, they, what, they witnessed his works, they watched him die, and they said, that's not God. God is powerful, not vulnerable. Uh, God is, is distant, not that close. Uh, God is high and lifted up. God is fill in the blank with whatever high and noble ideas you think that God has to have if God is worthy of your worship. Jesus Christ failed to measure up to a lot of people's conceptions of who God is and how God acts. So the church 
had to come up with the idea of there being not only one God, but at the same time being Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to do justice to Jesus, God's own definition of himself. You know, in the Apostles' Creed, we confess that we believe in God the Father, Creator, God the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And we confess that we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only begotten Son. And we confess that God is, we believe that God is the Holy Spirit. You know, we are asserting by that confession a, a more complex and challenging God than so many people think of. Uh, one might think that it would, it would suffice if we simply said, we believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I mean, nine out of ten people probably would go along in this country with that confession. But the creed also affirms that we believe God is also the Son, Jesus Christ, His only begotten. And also that God is the dynamic, uh, revealing, uh, mysterious Holy Spirit, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, yet one God. You know, to say that God is triune is to say more than some people won't say it. I find that a lot of people uh, in society just simply want God to be generic, um, abstract, distant, arcane. I mean, we really can't say anything definite about God, they say. God is large. God is indistinct. God is vague. God is this big blurry concept that we really can make mean anything that we want it to. Uh, something spiritual, uh, someone that we can make over into something that looks very much like ourselves. Somebody said that in the beginning God created us in God's own image and ever since we have been returning the favor. <laughs> Making God in our own image. Well, in Jesus Christ, God got physical. In Christ, God got explicit, peculiar, Close to us, too close for comfort for many, many people. Jesus Christ is God in action. God refusing to remain a vague general idea or a high lofty principle Jesus Christ is God in motion toward us. God refused to stay enclosed in God's own divinity. He cast his lot among us and became one of us. Many people think of God as this vaguely benevolent being that really never actually gets around to doing anything. You know, some minimalist, some um, um, inactive, um, unobtrusive, 
uh, non-invasive, detached God, you know, who's just about as much uh, of a God as we moderns want or can take. And uh, there are those who attempt to render Jesus as simply this, this good moral teacher who uh, was a loving person, one who loved lilies and one who loved children, uh, one who loved people with disabilities. Let me tell you something. Jesus Christ from the first refuses to be managed by us. And his followers drew the conclusion that not only was he a human being like us, but that he was a God unlike us. And they started talking about, they started saying such things as, in Jesus Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself. God is one. God is one. That's up and down the scriptures and up and down the ages. God is one. But not simply one. Not merely one. So we baptize, as this scripture we read a moment ago tells us to do, and we are baptized in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which I think is, uh, signifies that baptism relates us to the fullness of God. We as Christians are monotheist. That means we believe in one God. But we are not mere monotheist. We believe that the God who is present to us in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit at the same time as Three distinct yet unified and interactive, relational, and loving ways in which God is one. You know, if you think about it, our scripture tells us that God is love. Now, as far as I know, there's no other religion in the world that says that. Other religions say that God loves, that this is an activity of God, that this is an attribute of God, that God does love. But as far as I know, the Christian faith is the only one that says God is love. Love is who God is. It's God's nature. And if that's true, if that's true, then there is this play of lover and the beloved and the shared love between the lover and the beloved. God is the lover, the Son is the beloved, and the love between them, the love shared between them, is the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? God is love. Well, uh, we believe in the Trinity. That God is God in three ways being the same God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. The Father is God. And yet there is one God. Now our Unitarian friends believe that God is simply one. 
And I'll be honest with you, that's, that's easier on the brain than Trinitarianism. But it's like one of my friends of old used to say, hey, look, the Trinity, try to explain it and you'll lose your mind. Deny it and you'll lose your soul. <laughs> Uh, there's, uh, there's, no, there, there's, there's no way to do justice to God, the God whom we have met in Jesus Christ, without believing three ways in one God. You know, we, we talk about the three persons of the Trinity. That word person comes from the word persona. It meant a mask like one would wear in the theater. Sometimes you play this role, sometimes you play that role, and still another role. God primarily relates to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Those are the three primary ways that God relates to us. Now, in order to keep God distant and vague, which is just another way of saying uh, keeping God irrelevant, uh, many want to keep God very, very simple, uncomplicated, abstract. You know, these are the people who say, well, you know, I'm, I'm not a very religious person, but I do believe in God. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? But here's the problem. You see, once you discover the God who was in Jesus Christ, things get more demanding. Things get more complex. Things get more interesting than we first thought. After meeting Jesus Christ, we can't think of God in the simple, uncomplicated way as we once did before. Okay, now, three points. You know, somebody says, I don't know who started this, but somebody says every good sermon needs to have at least three points. So this morning, I'm going to preach a three-point sermon. Not bad for a Trinity Sunday, honey, right? <laughs> um, one, one. God is the creative and caring Father. But not simply from the beginning of creation. Oh no. Darkness to light, chaos to order, something out of nothing as the writer of Hebrews tells us. No, 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 no. This continues every day. God keeps creating. God keeps making something out of nothing. God keeps making a way where we thought there was no way. God is, keeps, he keeps on loving and caring and Creating, he keeps on reaching out in active love, constantly watching over us in vigorous providential care. God is the creative, caring Father. Two, God is also the redeeming, loving, seeking Son who ventures forth to seek, to search, to save those who are lost, those who are living in the far country. An expression from the parable of the prodigal son. When God decisively came to us, God came to us as one of us. He got incarnate, in a, in a Jew from a little obscure village called Nazareth, born in a most embarrassing way to a young peasant woman, 
and grew up to be a man that we know little about except for the three years of his young adult ministry and was tortured to death by the government. That one God is among us. You know, it's very interesting to me that the Gospels don't tell everything that Jesus said or that Jesus did. Uh, the Gospels limit themselves to, though, to, to those words and those events that have to do with our redemption. Those words and events that relate to God as redeeming us. God doing something about that problem between God and us. The name Jesus, uh, the name Joshua, it's the same, means God saves. He, the, the Gospels depict Jesus as the answer to the problem that is between God and us. Jesus is God saving the world. Jesus embodies for God so loved the world of John 3.16. And Paul says in Ephesians, you who were far off have been made one by the blood of Jesus Christ who has broken down the dividing wall between us. That's in chapter 2 and verse 14. God is a living, active, loving God who makes union and breaks down barriers and those who were far off and have now been made near. That's you. And that's me. God has kicked down those walls, those barriers that we have erected in an attempt to keep God out of our lives. We who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. Number three of the Trinity. <laughs> God is also Holy Spirit. God is the present dynamic Holy Spirit. God near us. God empowering us to do things that we could not do on our own. God constantly revealing God to us. God talking to us about God. And I would say uh, also God who is praying to God within us. That's the Holy Spirit who makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit is known chiefly by its effects, the effects of the Holy Spirit. I'm talking about the cause of all holiness in us, enlightening our understandings, rectifying our wills and affections, renewing our natures, God uniting, assuring, revealing, purifying, sanctifying us, to do the full eternal enjoyment of God, as one theologian put it. In God the Son, we have this reconciling work for us. In God the Holy Spirit, we have this sanctifying, redeeming work in us. Now, here, all three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, 
aspects of, characteristics of, the truth about, the identity and being of the one God who reaches out relentlessly to us in three primary ways. Well, I'm coming in for the landing. Would you agree with me that the great challenge of us Christians is to honor the persons of the Trinity, keeping connected to and working with the one God who comes to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God means so much more than when we first thought. God is infinitely rich and varied. And we attempt not only to stay in love with, but we are loved by and return love to the one God who comes to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen.